Bien, pues en, en rigor llegamos a la última intervención del coloquio. Eh, en la tarde tendremos eh, más, pero será un poco distinto. Y bueno, me da particular placer eh, presentarles a... WJT Mitchell, a Tom Mitchell, quien, como muchos de ustedes saben, eh, estuvo con nosotros hace un año en un coloquio que convocamos conjuntamente con el Centro de la Imagen, titulado Las Tres Eras de la Imagen. Y, en fin, ya he mencionado algunos pormenores de la presencia renovada y muy venturosa de, de Tom entre nosotros, eh, felizmente ahora eh, ya desde, desde hace un año se, se estableció una eh, cálida eh, amistad eh, con, con muchos eh, de nosotros, entonces me da mucho gusto dar la bienvenida como un amigo y como un eh, valioso interlocutor. Eh, Tom es profesor de inglés e historia del arte en la, en la Universidad de Chicago. Desde el año 78 es editor de la revista interdisciplinaria Cultural Inquiry, que es un, un mundo, un universo enorme, importante, eh, editorialmente hablando, con una riqueza eh, casi inabarcable de, de materiales, de, de temas. Eh, es una publicación trimestral eh, de central importancia para la teoría crítica de las artes y de las ciencias humanas. Como estudioso y teórico de medios de comunicación, artes visuales y literatura, Mitchell está vinculado con los campos de la cultura visual y la iconología. Se le conoce principalmente por su trabajo sobre las relaciones de las representaciones visuales y verbales en diversos contextos. Entre sus diversas publicaciones voy a mencionar en primer lugar la más reciente que está celebrando, eh, no se ha traducido todavía al español, se llama Image Science, Iconology, Visual Culture and Media. Algunos otros títulos, What Two Pictures Want, The Last Dinosaur Book, Picture Theory, Art and the Public Sphere, Landscape and Power, Iconology and Language of Images, eh, todos ellos enormemente celebrados y circulados. Entonces, me da muchísimo gusto que esté nuevamente entre nosotros y le paso sin más la palabra. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor to be here in Mexico City uh, once again. I was here one year ago, and the memories of that are still warm. And I want to especially thank uh, Benjamin and all of the uh, people around 17, uh, the Institute for Critical Theory, uh, and all the others who've uh, given such wonderful hospitality to me and my wife, Janice Miserell Mitchell, who performed last night. Uh, it's interesting to start this talk uh, right after a discussion of improvisation, organization, uh, anarchism, uh, the state, the nation, uh, and particularly the question of dialogue. Uh, which the preceding speaker uh, raised in, I think, very interesting ways. And I say that because what I'm going to talk about is arguably the most difficult, uh, fractured, and frozen situation on the planet, and one that, in my view, is a kind of key to uh, the, the entire in atrocious condition. Not the only, it's not the only key. Another would be climate change, 
uh, and the de de deniers of climate change who refuse to engage in dialogue, but simply want to disrupt any kind of uh, address to uh, the destruction of our planet in the name of endless growth, productivity. But at the political level, at the level of war, uh, an extension of politics, as Clausewitz said, uh, there is another condition, which is, of course, uh, the Middle East and the central role of Israel-Palestine uh, as a kind of uh, touchstone, a, a central conflict in that area. Uh, and the terms I'm going to be bringing to address this are first, the idea of salvaging. Uh, there is a new kind of movement among the arts uh, internationally called salvage art in which artists use garbage or trash or refuse or ruins in order to reconstruct uh, something uh, that is habitable by human beings. We are living uh, not just in atrocious times, but times of massive destruction, uh, much of it not particularly creative, uh, leaving ruins everywhere. And of course, the Middle East is a place where ruination is most conspicuous. But in the so-called first world, in the US, in Detroit, and in Chicago, there are enormous parts of cities uh, that need to be salvaged. And so this is in part about what role the arts could play in uh, salvaging the actual living conditions of uh, human beings on this planet. Another key word will be collaboration, uh, which I think along with dialogue is a very difficult term to invoke in some contexts. Uh, everyone loves dialogue. They th think it is the answer. But one of the questions that has to be asked is, what does it mean to invoke the virtues of dialogue when someone has their hands around your throat and is controlling your breathing? That, uh, and they keep saying, let's have a dialogue. We, we want you to be an honest partner. That, unfortunately, I think, is the condition of radical inequality of wealth and power control that obtains in Israel-Palestine. And it's why when you use the word dialogue in the Palestinian territories, you will see people roll their eyes in dismay and say, please don't talk to us about dialogue because someone's fingers are around our throat. Uh, I am not going to talk at great length about the atrocity that is the occupation of the West Bank. Uh, I'll let this slide uh, sort of speak for me. Uh, I think of it as an atrocious image. Uh, unfortunately, a t-shirt being worn by uh, an Israeli uh, teenager uh, expressing the atrocious moral condition that is being imposed on the youth of Israel today, who are, uh, uh, of course, uh, required to do military service and military service, not especially in the defense of their country, but in the continuation of occupying uh, the, the lands, the villages, uh, and the persons of uh, over a million people in the occupied territories. That also includes Gaza. So, and, and this terrible slogan, one shot, two kills, suggests what the meaning of that occupation is. It's not simply control. The, goal of the occupation, I think, more or less explicitly since it began in 1948, uh, has been to expel the Palestinians or to make them, uh, as some American politicians say, to self-deport. The hope is that the Palestinians will leave uh, and that it will become an entirely Jewish state. Uh, Here's something that says more than I could uh, in thousands of words about the history of the occupation uh, since 1948. You'll see uh, the progression. The, the white stands for Jewish uh, controlled territories, the green for Palestinian. Uh, and those Palestinian territories, as you can see, the, the West Bank is not under the control uh, of the Palestinians. Uh, 
every bullet that is handed to a Palestinian policeman is handed to them by uh, an Israeli administrator and has to be accounted for. So the actual, when you get up closer, you see something like Ayel Weizmann's map of the occupation in which uh, the West Bank has been divided into tiny Bantu stands uh, in which it's extremely difficult to get from one place to another. It should take, for instance, about 15 minutes to a half hour to go from Ramallah to Jerusalem. Uh, it can take all day uh, because of the checkpoints, uh, some of them permanent, some of them unpredictably thrown up with, without warning. So to live in the West Bank, it's very difficult to convey this to people who've never been there. To live inside the West Bank is to live in a feeling of constantly going through checkpoints, constantly uh, uh, surrounded by soldiers, uh, intercepted by, by so soldiers, subject to search, and to very humiliating treatment. So all of that said, uh, as a background to this essay, we have something called the two-state solution, which is uh, the, generally regarded by the elders of our world, certainly the US elders, and um, the, uh, the Israelis officially say the two-state solution is the only sensible thing. Uh, but how do you make a two-state out of a fragmented checkerboard of this sort? This is becoming uh, extremely difficult to imagine, uh, perhaps impossible, although it continues to be the official ideology uh, of most of the world. The Palestinians must have a state. But how can you have a state when you have no contiguous borders, when you have no control over your own territory? This is why some of us have said it's time to start thinking about one state, a state that is a hyphenated state, Israel-Palestine, or Palestine-Israel. Uh, that might not be a solution to anything. Uh, there are arguments against it, that these people can never live together, so they must be separated. I think that's uh, a dangerous delusion, but, uh, and, and it's also, uh, to use an American expression, it is the carrot hung in front of the donkey. You know this idea, you put a carrot on a string in front of the donkey and it keeps chasing that carrot, although it will never reach it. I think that's what the two-state two solution is. Uh, it continually invokes the notion of, we're just waiting for dialogue to unfold, we're just waiting for the Palestinians to be reasonable. Uh, why won't they uh, have a dialogue with it? You've heard these cliches over and over again. Uh, I think it's time, uh, it has been a time for a long time, uh, to think in terms of a single state. And I would further suggest not to think of it as a solution to anything, but simply uh, as a, a condition, a real condition, uh, that is the actual state of Israel-Palestine at the present time. In other words, the word state, I want you to think of not as a nation state or a governmental entity so much as uh, a condition or a situation, a state of affairs, if you will. That doesn't eliminate the more precise meaning of the political state, uh, which is also an actual, though denied, condition of Israel-Palestine today. That is, the state of Israel holds all the military and economic power over the entire region, including the West Bank and Gaza, which Gaza, by the way, according to the U.S. intelligence services, it is still under military occupation, even though the settler settlements have been removed. It's, uh, in every real sense, still a, a military zone. Uh, so, my impulse here is to follow Bashir Makul's suggestion that we formulate the imagined hybrid community of a binational entity, a state, a federation, or community, uh, and not with a hyphen that suggests a single composite entity, but with a slash that acknowledges the inequality of wealth and power and the long history of violence that marks the relation of Israel and Palestine. Um, and I want to move toward a consideration of uh, what can art do 
in a situation like this? Uh, one answer is almost nothing, very little. Uh, art is not uh, exactly a military or economic force significant to, to change very much. Art addresses the imagination, the emotions, the desires of people. So art is one way in which a different world might be imagined, a better world. Uh, it also, and I think that's not the only thing it can do. Art, the other thing art does very wonderfully is its ancient and classical task of representing reality as it is, showing the truth, exposing the way people live, the way they think, uh, how they imagine their world. So it's not just fantasies of utopia, but also uh, realistic depictions of fantasy. And that's, I want to begin with this work by a, a Jewish artist, an Israeli, uh, Larry Abramson, uh, who calls this Israel's utopia, which is a beautiful uh, bi-level settler's uh, home uh, inside of a sea of abstraction, green and blue. The green grass, often uh, the same kind of green grass you would find in an American suburb, and the clear blue sky of the ideal suburban utopia. What Abramson is doing then, it, I know it sounds paradoxical to do this, is, but to, he's providing a realistic image of a fantasy, of how people imagine their world. Uh, you might think of this also as a kind of allegory of daily life in Tel Aviv, city which I've been to many times, in which you would never know that a million people are living under a brutal occupation just 10, 15 miles away, uh, because people go around their, about their daily life only with a vague sense of anxiety, something might happen, the Palestinians might rise up, but they have no experience. It's very difficult for them to get experience of what it's like, uh, the other side of the border that divides their country. Only the settlers see that, and even they don't see very much of it because they have their own roads which cut them off from the rest of the West Bank. So a world of abstraction is created as the fantasy utopia uh, of uh, many Israelis. And uh, Abramson is simply trying to realistically, in his way, show how sometimes abstraction is realism about a psychological state of affairs. Another very significant Israeli artist who op operates in the mode of realism, critical realism, is Mickey Kratzman, a wonderful photographer who uh, began documenting dividing lines between Israelis and Palestinians some years ago. Th this wall was constructed uh, well before the current uh, very brutal security wall. It's a wall at uh, the settlement in the West Bank known as Gilo. The inhabitants of Gilo love the view of the hillside across from them, which is a Palestinian village called Bait Jala. Uh, but they didn't want to really see that village. They wanted to be protected from it because they regarded that village as the home of the enemy. Uh, so uh, some Russian immigrants trained in socialist realism uh, were commissioned to paint a trompe l'oeil mural on this wall to replace the real Palestinian village uh, with a fantasy one uh, so that the settlers at Gilo could feel like they were living in the country but without any of the risks that go with living in a country where uh, a very large majority of people are living in uh, atrocious conditions. This is a kind of improvisation of a fantasy. Uh, and, of course, it was easy to break that fantasy. All you had to do was walk up the hill a few meters and take a different kind of picture to see how this uh, illusion uh, of a pacified landscape was being enforced. Or you could look at a place where it was under construction to see uh, how the fantasy deconstructs itself. Kratzman also is a documentarian of the occupation of the Negev Desert, where many Bedouin tribes uh, live. Bedouin tribes are nomadic. Their way of life is, to, is without borders. They roam 
and improvise their life around certain oases that they return to. Recently, the uh, Israeli army has been removing Bedouins. They regard them uh, as bandits, as uh, dangerous uh, people. And so uh, they remove the markers of their, the oases where they come back every year to camp. And Kratzman decided to document the improvised markers of these vanishing oases. It's, um, uh, it, it, th these things only last for 24 hours. Uh, then they're removed by the military. But Kratzman, using one of the classic modes of photography, that is documentary as a way of remembering what some people would like to erase and forget, uh, he will not let these markers be forgotten, even though the actual markers disappear, his photographs remain. Now, Israel has not always been this way, and some Israeli filmmakers uh, have tried to find out what it was before uh, the occupation, before the terrible transformation of the map of Israel-Palestine occurred uh, that I began by showing you. Uh, I'm going to show you a film clip here <clears throat> of a, a film called What I Saw in Hebron. Hebron, as you know, is uh, a city of uh, almost a million Palestinians, uh, who live with uh, the, the holy center uh, where the tomb of Abraham is supposed to be located <clears throat> is occupied by uh, a kind of internal urban settlement of uh, a few hundred Orthodox Jews who have no relation to their neighbors except one of military occupation and hostility. Hebron uh, historically, in the 19th century and up till uh, really 1948, was a place where uh, Jews and Palestinians lived together. Uh, bad things happened. For instance, in 1929, uh, there is the famous Hebron massacre, in which a rumor went out uh, from Jerusalem uh, that uh, the Israelis were mounting an army and were going to take, take over the countryside. Uh, there was a massacre of yeshiva students in uh, uh, August of 1929. But uh, in Isra two Israeli filmmakers, uh, Noit and Dan Giva, went to Hebron to interview <clears throat> the families, uh, the children who were just teenagers, now they're, they're senior citizens, the children who lived in Hebron and who have memories of this moment. And this is just a brief conversation in which the Palestinian and uh, Israeli families are getting together, and two of the, the elders are talking about their experience. אני מדבר, זה לא, זה מה שיש עכשיו, לא, לא, לא משפחות האלה מהמי שהיו מקודם. וגם, אוכל שלו, זה שרה ויש רבקה. יש שרה ויש רבקה. כן, 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 כן. וזה קוראים לו חדיר, ו... בנימין, כן. בנימין יש לנו וגם... יש להם שמות עבריים, לקוחים וגם היה חדר בשבילהם, חדר היה בשבילהם. זה היה גם בשמות ערבים במשפחה, במשפחות היהודיות, כאות של ידידי. הסבתא של ישמע היה סמרה, שזה שם ערבי. הם היו מניקים, אלה, את ילדיה של אלה, כשלא היה צורך. ממש, כן, כן. קשר, כן, כן, היה קשר חלב בין שתי המשפחות, זה לא צחוק. ולכן הם קוראים בשמות של אחד של השני גם. ואנחנו מדברים עכשיו, נעים מאוד מהמשפחה מאני היו פה. אולי יש משפחות, עוד משפחות, אנחנו לא יודעים. וברוך הבא לכולם, כל הזמן. זהו. And talks about a time when 
uh, they refer to themselves as milk cousins because uh, uh, Jewish and Arab babies would be passed across the, the wall between houses when a mother's milk did not come in. They also shared their names. Uh, what happened in the 1920s was the, first ar the arrival of the first wave of Zionists. Uh, and the Zionist program was, from the beginning, one that re regarded Palestine as the destined national home uh, of the Jewish people. One little inconvenient point, there were already uh, people living there, the, namely the Palestinians. So the question is what to do with them. Uh, the uh, unofficial policy of Israel has been get rid of them. Uh, ethnic cleansing is, it won't name itself, but that is uh, what the Israeli policy has been since 1948, since they were in a position with international world ba uh, backing to take over the entire country. But th they haven't erased a memory of a time when Jews and Arabs lived together peacefully, as they did all over the Middle East. Uh, in many ways, today's Middle East is a kind of nightmare, uh, a, a, atrocity, a reduction of a time when there was, and it makes some people actually nostalgic for the Ottoman Empire, which uh, oppressive as it was, managed to uh, produce a kind of uh, uh, a peaceful uh, regime in that region. I, I wanna show you a couple more uh, film clips. And so far I've been show, showing you mainly work by Israeli artists. Uh, this is a film called Checkpoint, which I think gives you a kind of insight. It's what we call a fly on the wall documentary. Uh, it is, and it is a, uh, by an Israeli film crew that traveled around and uh, were able to gain insight into what goes on uh, behind the scenes at uh, a typical checkpoint. This is the one between uh, Ramallah and Jerusalem. And uh, it's simply uh, 60 seconds of a young border guard, probably a perfectly nice young man, uh, talking about his daily life uh, as an occupier. so this is uh, to be understood as the Israelis looking at themselves in the mirror uh, uh, without flinching, which I think is uh, one of the most admirable sides uh, of Israeli art production today. Uh, particularly at the level of documentary, but also as in Larry Abramson's at a more symbolic level. And this kind of self-revelation, which I think says a lot uh, about the honesty of uh, the Israeli art world, uh, is increasingly uh, unpopular, increasingly discomforting uh, to those who would rather forget, who would rather not see what is going on in their name. Uh, I, I could show you another film called For My Children, which is simply a film documenting the internal debates of an Israeli family about uh, whether they should stay or uh, return to the United States. They have dual citizenship and they could return to San Francisco any time. And the reason this debate is breaking out is because their children are approaching uh, military age, so 17, 18 years old. And the father says something quite remarkable in this film uh, to his wife. He says, you know, if we were, if our children had to risk their lives to defend our country against an invasion, I wouldn't hesitate. That would be one kind of thing. That would be a noble task. You have to defend yourself. But to participate in this occupation 
is morally corrupting uh, for them. And that's because they have seen uh, what goes on in these checkpoints and the way uh, the moral sensibility of young people who are put into uniform, given weapons, and told your job is to control uh, a population that really resents you deeply, uh, doesn't want you there, uh, and to, uh, to subject them to daily humiliation. That's, that's not good for your soul. And as you can see, this young man thinks it's, his way of dealing with it is to turn it into a joke. Uh, Ramallah is a zoo, and we are the zookeepers. So I want to show you now something from the other side, um, which is also about checkpoints. One thing that um, uh, the, the film Checkpoint, from an Israeli point of view, can do that is impossible for a Palestinian is it can achieve a kind of fly-on-the-wall realism, because an Israeli camera crew can go to a checkpoint and uh, show what's happening there, although that is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, is, many Israelis just don't want to see this kind of thing. They want to deny that it goes on. But this is uh, Khaled Jarrar, a young artist in Ramallah, and he is showing you if you, if you don't have a pass to go through the checkpoint, if you can't see the checkpoint, uh, how do you get from Jerusalem uh, to Ramallah or vice versa? And the answer is shown in this uh, little film called Journey <laughs> One Ten. what improvisation under occupation looks like. This is, a, uh, I think, a terrific insight into it. The Palestinians have to find a way to get to their families uh, who live a few miles away in Jerusalem. The way they go if they don't have a pass, which is very difficult to get, uh, is to go through the sewers. This is called Journey 110 because it's a 110-meter passageway that bypasses the uh, the checkpoint between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Uh, J Journey 110 also, I think, formally exposes uh, something of the conditions of Palestinian art making uh, and particularly video production. Uh, that is, you have to uh, learn how to film in total darkness, how to film uh, underground, how to make sense out of a world in which you are improvising uh, waterproof boots. Uh, in, in the longer version of this film, you see women uh, taking off their high heels, their fancy shoes, putting them in a plastic garbage bag, and then taking two other garbage bags and wrapping them around their feet uh, going through. The film also, I think, shows why Palestinians, like human beings everywhere, uh, are great improvisers. They find a way uh, to get past uh, every barrier very, very difficult. And this is why the occupation is such a toxic condition for both sides. Uh, what it brings out on the Israeli side is shame, bad behavior. On the Palestinian side, uh, uh, improvisation under desperate and atrocious conditions. But sometimes the improvisation, and this is one of the things that I think is key to the durability of the Palestinian aspirations is a terrific sense of humor. So Sharif Waked, a few years ago, <clears throat> made uh, a, a mock documentary about 
a Palestinian fashion show, which he called, uh, quite cleverly, Chic Point. Uh, Chic Point uh, it imagines a fashion show for men who need to go through Israeli checkpoints, Palestinian men. What you have to do when you go through a checkpoint is to open your coat uh, and roll up your shirt to reveal that you're not wearing a suicide belt. So uh, what does a smart fashion designer do uh, in a situation like this? Well, Ked tried to imagine it. Let me uh, see. Like, yeah, here we are. So the Sheik point, I think, illustrates one of the most important things that comes uh, to human beings as a way of improvising the possibility of daily life uh, in atrocious conditions, and that is a sense of humor. I read recently about a man who was held in solitary confinement for 10 years, and he was asked how could he psychologically survive? I mean, uh, it's, uh, solitary confinement is designed to drive you mad, uh, and it can happen very quickly. Just imagine yourself locked in a room without human contact uh, for 24 hours a day. Uh, and his answer was, I had to find something every day to laugh at. Uh, and in a way, that's uh, one thing that's very hard to see. Uh, but if you travel inside the West Bank or Gaza, this is one thing you see over and over again, is the, uh, the moment of finding something to laugh at in, uh, in atrocious conditions. One of the most uh, important uh, collaborative efforts in, in uh, the current state has been what Goethe called the West uh, East Divan, the attempt to find a point of dialogue and communication between Israelis and Palestinians, between uh, and to overcome this dominant ideology of the day, which is uh, the clash of civilizations, manifested mainly with Islamophobia in the U.S., uh, in which uh, if you've been following the American election right now, uh, one of the candidates, namely Donald Trump, uh, wants to suspend all uh, visas, all entry of Arab nationals uh, in, into the United States. A completely crazy notion, uh, given that we actually do have diplomatic relations with many of these countries, uh, but very popular among uh, an extreme right base, which of course, in a, in a country the size of the United States, it involves millions of people who will gather in uh, roaring crowds to cheer for hate, to cheer for fear. Uh, it's the same dynamic, I'm, a, uh, I'm sorry to say, that occupies Israel when uh, Benjamin Netanyahu makes a very crowd-pleasing speech in which he demonizes the Palestinians, says they don't want to have dialogue, all they want to do is kill us, and so uh, we, all we can do is try to make life miserable for them. But this exception, Edward Said and Daniel Berenboim, uh, involves an improvisatory collaboration at the level of music. And it's a kind of test case. I, I'm a member of uh, a movement uh, called Boycott Divest Sanction, which urges the boycott of Israeli uh, the institutions, uh, particularly financial, military, uh, factories, especially Israel is one of the great suppliers of weapons research today. They are at the absolute forefront of drone technology and many of their innovations have been uh, adopted by the U.S. military. So uh, the boycotting of those kinds of things seems to me a straightforward question. But BDS also includes a cultural and academic boycott, which is much more difficult to negotiate 
especially for those of us who belong to the academy uh, or are part of cultural institutions. Uh, the answer of the boycott has been to differentiate between your institutional identity and your individual identity as a scholar, an artist, uh, a musician. And that's the case with Baron Boyman Said. Uh, so this is one version of, it's a, if there's a utopian moment, uh, it is in this collaboration uh, between Baron Boim and Said to make music the common ground in which dialogue, uh, or at least the imagination of coexistence might occur. Said also has written about the interwoven histories of Israelis and Palestinians as something like a, uh, using a musical analogy as a counterpoint a contrapuntal structure in a tragic symphony. Uh, the, the boycott movement is, of course, struggling right now with the West East Devon over terms like collaboration and dialogue. And the boycott movement is itself divided. I'm on the side of, yes, I say yes to this kind of collaboration. Some think it's what they call normalization or collaboration in the bad sense. I want to move now to a kind of third party view of this, a classic uh, bit of film by Godard from Notre Musique, uh, a film in which he reflects on uh, as a filmmaker uh, who is trying to think Israel Palestine uh, as one thing, but one thing that is clearly uh, subject to radical division. Par exemple, en 1948, les Israélites marchent dans l'eau vers la terre promise. Les Palestiniens marchent dans l'eau vers la noyade. Chant et contre-chant. Chant et contre-chant. Le peuple juif rejoint la fiction, le peuple palestinien le documentaire. Godard begins with a comparison of photographs of Jewish and Arab identities in the Nazi stereotypes of Juif and Musulman. Uh, if you recall your Holocaust history, Musulman, uh, which basically means the same as Muslim, was a term that could be applied to anyone who looked as if they were on the fast track to death. Uh, when they became apathetic, no longer capable of uh, any kind of resistance, any kind of affirmation of their human dignity, they were referred to as a Muslim. Uh, but th there's a historic background to this, which I think is extraordinarily important, especially for rethinking uh, the, the way the Nazis regarded the Jews. Uh, the Nazis inherited a long tradition of European anti-Semitism, which in the Middle Ages made no differentiation between Jews and Muslims. They were all Semites. So anti-Semitism uh, was an equal opportunity label uh, to put on Arabs and Jews. And this is why in some ways Israel-Palestine, when seen in a long historical lens, is such an incredibly paradoxical entity. Uh, because there is this history of uh, Jews and Arabs living peacefully together in Palestine, and there is a history throughout the Arab world uh, of uh, Jewish and Arab cooperation, uh, collaboration, Zionism, is a kind of inheritor of the Christian hatred of both Jews and Arabs. Uh, it goes back to the Crusades. And this is why whenever the US as a Christian country seems to side with Israel uh, against uh, the Palestinians, all of these memories of the Crusades and the, this, this very atrocious history comes back to haunt people. So Godard is evoking, I think, uh, a, a great deal when he simply looks at the Holocaust with the, the population of it as Juif and Muslim, 
together. He proceeds to photographs taken in 1948 when, as he says, Israelis get in the water towards the promised land and Palestinians get in the water to drown. Result, he says, the Jewish people become fiction, the Palestinian people become documentary, shot, reverse shot. I think that's too simple, but it does open up an interesting question. The relation between the cinematic form of shot, reverse shot, and the relation of peoples who do not, cannot engage in dialogue. Um, his linkage of the two peoples to cinematic <clears throat> forms of dialogue and intersubjectivity and to the fundamental types of film genres, that is fiction and documentary, <clears throat> is probably too neat and symmetrical. Obviously, documentary and fiction are present on both sides of the separation border, uh, we've already seen. And the typical cinematic representation of dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis is rarely conveyed by shot, reverse shot. Uh, more characteristic, <clears throat> uh, especially in documentaries about the occupation, is the portrayal of Palestinians attempting to start a conversation, pleading their case to mute, uh, unresponsive Israeli soldiers who refuse to talk. Uh, and I could show you many clips of that very scene in which not only shot reverse shot is impossible, but uh, any kind of dialogue is uh, uh, discouraged. One film that tries to do this is by another Israeli filmmaker, Avi Magrabi, a film called Avenge But One of My Two Eyes. Uh, title is based on a, a line from the book of Judges in the Bible. It's a, the words of Samson uh, calling on God to avenge him, restoring his strength so he can pull down the temple on the, the Philistines. Uh, Magrabi's narrative is framed inside an ongoing telephone dialogue with an invisible Palestinian friend in the West Bank. We never see the Palestinian, but we hear his voice over the phone reporting on the latest Israeli military incursions into Ramallah, which occur really on a daily basis. What we see is the director, Magrabi, in his editing studio in his own home, trying to comfort his friend in vain. These scenes are intercut with television footage of the incursions just taken from Israeli TV and Magrabi's own incursions into the West Bank where he tries to shame the Israeli border guards, guards into letting Palestinian children pass through the checkpoints to get to school. He documents, in other words, important scenes available only to an Israeli insider, uh, such as a settler community's triumphant festival, complete with racial slurs against the Arabs, and the ominous tourist ritual conducted on the mountaintop of Masada, uh, a favorite tourist destination in Israel where guides retell the story of the ancient Israelites' refusal to surrender to the Romans and their decision to commit collective suicide rather than be captured and enslaved. This story is then promptly interpreted as an allegory of modern Israel's Samson option, or what's also called the Masada complex. It's tacit warning that a nuclear-armed Israel will never allow itself to be conquered but will take the world along with it. This, the language, by the way, uh, contemporary language Netanyahu loves to use of existential threats, uh, as if the Palestinians are an existential threat to Israel, or Iran for that matter, uh, is a version of this. The feeling of being so embattled that your very existence is at stake, and therefore you are free to do anything. The story of Masada, which I personally witnessed many years ago, uh, is, is followed in Magrabi's film by, th they always follow the story of the collective suicide of the ancient Hebrews with uh, a, a moral lesson. And Magrabi managed to capture this moment of dialogue in which a young uh, Jewish woman from New York City resists the lesson and points out to the guide that um, the women and children of Masada did not commit suicide. They were murdered by their men, an act directly contrary to Jewish law, which forbids both suicide and murder. 
So there is also a gender issue uh, at work here, a kind of machismo, which sometimes divides uh, the attitudes toward this feeling that you're constantly under existential threat. But arguably the, the most <clears throat> powerful recent example of cinematic collaboration in Palestinian filmmaking is a film called Five Broken Cameras from 2011, co-directed by Ahmad Bernat, a Palestinian farmer, and Guy Davidi, uh, an Israeli filmmaker. <clears throat> This is uh, a marvelous film, which is very difficult to summarize and involved a long and complex collaboration between uh, the, the Palestinian farmer and the Israeli filmmaker. Let me just summarize it by saying uh, that Bernat, uh, the, the Palestinian farmer, not a filmmaker, he, he bought his camera to document the growing up of his newborn son, Gabriel. Uh, and <clears throat> the title comes from the fact that over the first five years of this boy's life, um, Bernat also tried to film the nonviolent demonstrations in his little village against uh, the occupation. The occupation is not a static thing. It's a kind of growing force which continually encroaches on Palestinian land particularly farmland, sometimes by making it impossible to get from one place and another for a farmer to get from his home to his fields. And then laws have been passed to make it, make your farmland uh, vulnerable to confiscation if you don't get there to farm it. So it's a catch-22 situation. You prevent the Palestinians from farming, and then you say, well, you're not using your land, so we're taking it. For, and occupying it for a new settlement. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you several scenes from uh, Bernat and Davidi's film. Uh, uh, and these are scenes of nonviolent resistance, which are meeting quite immediately with, uh, with violent reaction from the Israeli soldiers, who uh, especially are upset by the presence of a camera, because cameras are uh, in some ways as powerful as guns. When we talk about shot reverse shot, uh, when somebody is doing something they know to be criminal, the last thing they want is a camera on them. And we've seen this again and again recently, the idea that American police have to have cameras attached to their bodies now uh, is a sign of how difficult it is to restrain them from using unnecessary force against civilians especially civilians of that occupied territory in America known as the Black Ghetto. So here's one scene. So this is the, uh, the first broken camera. I'm going to show you three of them. Uh, and you can see, in fact, the kind of precarious condition of the film image itself, which is under assault uh, as the, uh, the apparatus is beginning to break up. In this scene, something equally interesting happens that I want to call your attention to. to 
me, the interesting formal thing about this uh, uh, particular film clip is the way it employs a different kind of shot reverse shot. Of course, it's at the moment when uh, the attempt to speak to the other side is rejected. Uh, so the Palestinians begin to run away uh, and the Israeli soldiers begin to charge. Uh, but the other interesting fact is the location of the camera's point of view. As you can see, it is not just uh, Bernat's film from the Palestinian side, uh, not just his camera that is taking this footage, but uh, Guy Davidi's camera uh, on the other side with the Israeli soldiers. So this is the kind of exposure of a situation that can only occur if cooperation occurs, if some kind of improvised uh, collaboration is made possible. Uh, and this one finally, uh, I can get it to go. <laughs> That particular moment of shot reverse shot is almost unbearably literal because uh, Bernat's camera is aiming directly into the sniper rifle of an Israeli soldiers. Uh, this, by the way, has become uh, almost a genre of filmmaking across the Middle East, particularly now in Syria, where uh, people filming snipers with telephone cameras or with uh, other cameras uh, repeatedly witness their own death, as it is, because they are shot while taking a shot of a sniper. Uh, in this case, it was the camera that saved uh, Bernat's life. The bullet lodged and destroyed the camera, and that's what you see when the, when the picture breaks up. Uh, and he, he talks as well about the illusion he himself felt that somehow the camera provided an armor, that he couldn't be killed as long as he was filming. Of course, a complete delusion, and this is the closest he came. Uh, he was very badly wounded by that shot. Um, so, five broken cameras, all I can do here is to say, uh, please see this film. It was nominated for an Academy Award um, in, in uh, 2012, one of the finalists uh, for the Academy Award. And it was at the, in the same year uh, as another Israeli film, uh, a documentary called The Gatekeepers. Um, it was also among the finalists. And there's something uncanny about the arrival of these two films together because The Gatekeepers is a set of interviews with the, the leaders of uh, Mossad and Shin Bet, the security services of, uh, of Israel. Uh, it's five or six of these very, very powerful and prominent figures who are, I can tell you, are not artists. They're not sentimental about dialogue. They are the people who uh, basically control the security of Israel-Palestine and who are authorized to assassinate anyone uh, uh, anywhere, anytime, if they suspect them of terrorist uh, activity. Uh, they unanimously testify to one simple message, and that's that the, the entire strategy of the occupation and containment uh, and the attempt to ethnically cleanse Palestine uh, of Palestinians has been a dismal failure. Uh, it has made uh, Israel less secure. 
It has uh, produced a widespread paranoia and a sense of existential threat that is uh, basically the atrocious condition of this divided country today. I want to show you one more uh, documentary project. <clears throat> this is by uh, an Israeli, uh, a Sephardic Israeli, whose family comes from Libya, uh, part of the, uh, the Sephardic diaspora of Arab Jews, whose primary language is Arabic, uh, and many of whom migrated to Israel after 1948. Azalei went back into the archives uh, of Haganah, uh, one of the main forces in the initial uh, Zionist conquest of Palestine, to see what was going on in the villages. Uh, we know what was going on with David Ben-Gurion at the UN. We know uh, how Israel's legitimacy was recognized by the United Nations, uh, how the British mandate ended and uh, the Jewish state of Israel was founded. What we don't know and what Azaleh has recovered is what she calls the civil alliance of uh, Jews and Palestinians in 1947-48. So th this is a gathering of Arabs and Jews uh, who are looking at a map of Palestine and reading aloud from the archives about the actual conversations that took place in hundreds of villages across the country. Almost invariably, these villages were refusing the idea of war between the Arab countries uh, and other countries. The Palestinians said, we've lived with the Jews for a long time. If they want to call it a Jewish state, uh, that's, that's their business, but we don't want war. These are mainly, the Palestinians are an agrarian people primarily. They just wanted to continue with their daily life. So uh, this is Azalei's uh, uh, record of what the collaboration involved. Um, also, her account of why it was erased. The little that was known of the effects to promote civil treaties was presented in a negative light, in the ruling perspective through which civil partnership appears as collaboration, namely as an act of national treason. So what Azalei did was stage a civil reading of documents recording the actual efforts collected in the Haganah archive uh, which yield a complex picture full of hope and faith in the power of shared life. Uh, so it's a complete alternate history uh, to the one that has been the dominant history, the official history uh, since 1948. I'm going to end with just a little, uh, it's almost uh, a, a kind of illustration of the Palestinian sense of humor by uh, Khaled Jarrar, the same one who made the uh, Journey 110 video. This is, uh, as a work of art and a prop for a performance, he created the first Palestinian passport stamp. Uh, I have one, uh, this stamp in my own passport. Uh, it shows an olive branch and a dove, and uh, it shows you what a future state of Palestine might look, look like uh, living in peace. But it's not just the stamp itself, it's the ritual that goes with it. Whenever Palestinian families, usually from America or elsewhere, arrive uh, at the Ramallah bus station, Gerard is there waiting for them with his passport stamp and uh, you know, an, an ink pad, and he offers to stamp the passports. And he has a videographer with him who uh, records what happens. And it's often quite amusing because the families get off in one case, particularly, uh, mother and father and their teenage son get off the bus. He approaches them and says, would you like uh, me to stamp your passport with the, the, the first state of Palestine stamp? The teenage boy, of course, hands over his passport, says, yes, go ahead. I love it. Uh, the father hesitates. The mother says, don't you dare. Uh, get that thing in your passport because the Israelis will give us all kinds of trouble when we try to leave the country because uh, the West Bank is Israel. Uh, this is a completely unofficial and transgressive uh, tiny little stamp. Is it an existential threat to Israel? Hardly. Uh, but she's not wrong. Uh, 
if the, the Israelis study your passport very carefully and find this, they will give you a hard time because it's just another little sign, a tiny sign of resistance that is disturbing. I haven't shown you everything I could, but I think the time uh, has come maybe to have some questions and discussion and maybe in that uh, I'll show you some more things, but why don't I stop now and uh, uh, let's have some dialogue. Thank you very much. Can you pass me the mic? Mm -hmm. you want this? Bien, muchas gracias a Tom. ¿Nos pueden prender la luz, por favor, del público? Un poco más. Adelante, tienen la palabra. If nobody asks a question, I'm going to start talking again. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much for uh, your interesting presentation. I have a question about um, um, how art has been used a kind of uh, therapy in cases of, uh, you know, victims of uh, war and conflict. I, I know a case of... Um, it's a small organization that has initiated in the Netherlands. It's a group of uh, photographers. They are uh, professional photographers. And they have decided, because they, there was a specific case in Amsterdam of a group of uh, women, who, um, uh, Muslim women, um, who were recruited by uh, ISIS uh, to become um, wives of the soldiers and, you know, the members of ISIS. So they, they were taken to uh, Syria, but some of them uh, ran away and then they came back somehow to their families in, in different countries and some of them have, um, came back to Amsterdam. So there is this group of photographers who have decided um, to help them by using photography. So they are teaching them um, to do um, like collages and things like that. Uh, but my question was because I, I attended one of the exhibitions and um, you, you can tell, you know, the horror that they, they went through when they were in, in Syria. And uh, some of them even tell you by photographies, you know, they took uh, photos of um, things in the city or, or just trying to, um, I think that trying um, to put together like uh, pieces of uh, their memories using objects that they have at that moment. And, um, but, but but the interesting thing was that uh, even that they are professional photographers, the use of photography um, was um, done only as a kind of uh, therapy. Because what they are doing now is that uh, they are using photography in order to make these, uh, these uh, girls to express uh, the horror that they went through. But um, there is no more than that. After that, you know, there are exhibitions and sometimes the, the girls tell the, their testimonies, but uh, it stops there. So um, my question is, um, how to make possible for, you know, especially young people who have started using art in order to uh, represent and even to, to um, if you want to denounce the, the horror that we are living in our societies. So how to make possible for them to see art as what it is, you know, instead of uh, using art as therapy. But on the other hand, how to make possible that, you know, it's, it's kind of paradoxical because I know these, you know, photography is helping these girls, for instance to overcome the trauma somehow. So this conflict between, you know, art as therapy and art as art. Um, I don't think uh, there's that much of a contradiction. Uh, 
it seems to me that uh, the key link between art as therapy and art as well, whatever else it is, uh, is, is the ability to tell your story. Uh, it sounds like this project is very much like uh, the, the tactics of the new ethnography, uh, which has been pioneered by uh, some anthropologists, in which you don't come in with the anthrop anthropologist camera, uh, but you hand out cameras, uh, simple cameras, uh, to people who are not professionals. You empower a population to document their own stories. Uh, and that has the double effect of saying, okay, my story is worth recording, and not by me telling someone from outside, the white fella from uh, Sydney or uh, from the United States, but telling my own story in my own way. Uh, this was done some years ago. One of my students uh, in a class I was teaching on uh, media and mental illness uh, uh, went to the, uh, the, the clinics uh, on the south side of Chicago where the mentally ill come in uh, to get me medication. <clears throat> and she went with uh, very cheap uh, little video cameras, which she encouraged them then to tell their own stories with. And she, she produced an archive of, uh, of narratives, first person narratives, and particularly stories in which they were telling their stories to each other rather than to somebody who's an authority. Uh, I think it's a, a extraordinarily important uh, tactic of resistance. Uh, where, uh, people who are living in con atrocious conditions, they need to speak. One of the horrors, of course, is being suppressed, being invisible uh, and being forced into silence. That no one cares, no one hears. Uh, my voice will, you know, I can complain, but my voice disappears, and my, my very existence uh, disappears. So photography and, and video, uh, extremely important in that respect. And that's <clears throat> uh, one of the, the great benefits of the, um, the small uh, telephone camera, the way that uh, the phone camera has become so ubiquitous, is that that plus the internet makes it possible for people uh, to communicate uh, quite widely. It has its downside, I admit, but um, the, the idea of the citizen journalist who is empowered to make a documentary at any moment, to improvise a documentary out of uh, the, the, their own resources, whatever they are. So I'm not too worried about the contradiction between art and that, or uh, about whether it qualifies as art. If we want to call it outsider art, that's fine. If you want to call it citizen journalism uh, or simply using media uh, tactically for resistance, uh, those are all, I think, uh, the excellent ways of describing what you're talking about. Yes, my question has to do with one, one um, word or concept of your subtitle, you know, the binational state as a solution. Um, I wonder what your opinion is of, of, for me, an interesting proposal I read from a professor from the University of Tübingen, uh, Hans Küng, a well-known theologian, who became internationally known because he proposed to the United Nations the Universal Declaration of Human Obligations, besides the human, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, based on global ethics inspired by world religions. And he proposed that Jerusalem, instead of being a binational state, under the umbrella of the United Nations, can acquire the state similar like the Vatican state for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Because the Vatican state is a very unique uh, state form. And he proposed that might be that would function for, for the, uh, to acquire more peace in that very difficult area. No? 
Yeah, I think it's a very interesting proposal. Uh, it's, uh, I guess you could call it a tri-national urban state. Um, and historically, that, that was the condition of Jerusalem uh, for many years. Uh, I think after the first intifada, uh, the Israelis began to clamp down more and more on East Jerusalem, where most of the Palestinians live. And now, of course, it's as if you had a series of concentric circles of intensity. Uh, Israel itself is a kind of, in my view, the entire country uh, is in a, and I don't want to use the word multinational because it's totally wrong in this context, but it is a plurinational uh, realm in which, I mean, many Palestinians are Christians. They're not all Muslims. Uh, there are tribes, the, the Bedouins uh, are usually Muslims, but of a very different kind. Uh, in uh, the, the northern city of Nablus, there are Samaritans who are ancient Jews who speak Arabic as their native language and ancient Hebrew. Uh, the, the Samaritans are technically Jewish from the standpoint of the Jewish state, uh, but they are tolerated as a a tiny minority uh, within the Palestinian community because of their historic ties there and because also they hate Israel. Uh, it's a very curious kind of uh, combination. They wish the Israeli state would disappear so they could go back to their past. So uh, I think the, the key in whatever way you imagine a solution uh, and imagining a solution is extremely difficult uh, for obvious reasons. I think you need to start with, uh, that's what I tried to redefine state as not the nation state, but as the condition of things, the state of affairs. The state of affairs is one of plurinationality and uh, multiple religions. It's a polymorphous country with many different kinds, which has unfortunately been subjected to a binary operation uh, Jew versus Arab, Israeli versus Palestinian. And people need to learn how to speak a new language. The only way I can see of doing this uh, and to preserve what for most Israelis is non-negotiable, the idea of a Jewish state, is to say, let the Jewish nation continue to exist with inside of a state called Israel-Palestine uh, which is a secular democratic state in which all religions and all ethnicities uh, enjoy equal rights as citizens. Uh, it will undoubtedly continue for maybe a hundred years or more uh, as a state which is dominated by the Jewish people because of the wealth and power that they occupy. Just as in the United States, the U.S. is becoming a minority white country. White Christians are, you know, no longer going to be a majority in another 50 years. Uh, in many states like California, they already uh, are a minority. But that doesn't take away all the money and property uh, that they own. It, it, the problem is this inflated rhetoric of existential threats that if we give them this, if we give them their own land, if we grant them equal rights to vote, then we're doomed. Uh, somehow, uh, Israel has to get past that very difficult st sticking point uh, so that they can live, in a, not just in Jerusalem, but in the entire country as a place where uh, people live side by side as they once did. Uh, <clears throat> I suppose we could ask the Turks to restore the Ottoman Empire. That would be probably a terrible fantasy. Uh, to, to, to operate, but there was a time, and I think it shouldn't be forgotten. Hi, hi, Tom. Uh, before, before I ask my question, I just want to say that I do strongly believe in the transformative capacity of art. Um, but I w upon seeing these images, I wonder if, uh, and my question is, are these artists known in Israel? Do they show in Israel? If so, where? Or are they uh, preaching to the converted, so to speak? Are they artists that show more in Europe and the States? It's, a, it's a good question. Um, and 
Uh, Larry Abramson, very well known. He's the head of, uh, what was the head of the art school, Bezalel Art Academy, um, and uh, now runs the art school at um, Shankar University, close to Tel Aviv. <clears throat> so Larry's very well known. The Palestinian uh, artists are not so well known in, in Israel. They are well known internationally. Uh, and uh, the, um, I didn't mention, by the way, uh, Mona Hatoum and other internationally recognized Palestinian artists. I was more interested in the ones who are working inside <clears throat> the country. But uh, one way to answer your question is to go back to the 1980s <clears throat> to perhaps the most famous Palestinian artist of that moment. Um, <clears throat> this is a, was a young man. Um, his name was, let me uh, grab it up here, Asim Abu Chakra. Uh, Abu Chakra, a young painter in his 20s, he died tragically, lung cancer uh, at age 29. But he was the most gifted painter <clears throat> uh, among uh, young Palestinians who live inside of Israel. You have to remember, there are 750,000 Palestinians living inside Israel proper, uh, if that's the right phrase to use. So Abu Chakra made expressionist canvases of this sort, uh, which became deeply valued by Israeli collectors. <clears throat> and that's because they all share the same motif. They, they show what's called the sabra plant, uh, the prickly pear cactus, which is everywhere, uh, and which uh, I've written about this particular artist and this plant. You might call it the totem plant uh, of Israel because the word sabra uh, not only means cactus, it's the name for a native-born Israeli, somebody who was born there. Very important to establish your national status with saying, I was born in this country. My roots are in the ground here. Uh, I am not an immigrant. Uh, and that's obviously internally to the Israeli communities. That's a very important distinction. Are you a Sabra or are you not? Uh, <clears throat> Abba Eben, uh, the former foreign affairs minister, deputy prime minister, ambassador to the United States, uh, who is a great scholar of Hebrew and Arabic literature, was an immigrant from South Africa. Uh, Larry Abramson, the artist, is also not a Sabra. But what Asim Abu Chakra glimpsed was the kind of fantasy of the native born, the one who has the right by virtue of where they happen to be born. Of course, a huge issue in the US too, uh, where we, we have children, Mexican children, uh, millions of Mexican children who are born to illegal immigrant parents, but who have the right to citizenship because of where they were born. This is one thing Donald Trump would roll back immediately and say, no, no, you can't do it. So why did these paintings become such fetish objects for wealthy Israeli collectors back in the 80s? Uh, you, one of these paintings now uh, could fetch you a million dollars, uh, particularly given the iconography. You notice that the Sabra plant is not rooted in the ground. It's a potted plant. Uh, it's been transplanted. Uh, and uh, so no longer is living in its native soil, but in you know uh, something you buy at the local store. So in a way, it's a kind of, um, I'm only answering this in relation to your question about fame and circulation. In some sense, this incredibly powerful body of painting, which today is showing in uh, the Tel Aviv Museum, uh, is it's a kind of ironic symbol uh, of exactly what the Sabra uh, meant and continues to mean. A kind of myth of occupation based on being rooted in the ground, uh, in the sacred soil of the Holy Land. And Abu Chakra fetishized it, made it into a totem, and at the same time deconstructed it by transplanting it into a pot. You know, sometimes art, it just takes you a long time to see what an artist is doing. In this case, it took many years before people really had other than saying, oh, well, he's really a great painter. He knows how to handle color. Uh, I think that was the original thing. And then the Sabra was an, a potent symbol.
but it was a potent symbol. It had more power than anyone, anybody guessed, I think. Um, but, um, I'm, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Uh, here. Uh, here, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to speak in Spanish. I feel a, a little bit more comfortable to do it. So, so if you can use your uh, earphones, please. Uh, wait, just wait a minute. Yeah, sure. Ok, gracias. Eh, bueno, gracias por esta, esta mirada. Eh, tengo muchas cosas encima, pero voy a ser breve eh, para también tratar de, de encontrar una respuesta a muchas preguntas que, que me hacen y a veces no sé cómo responder. Pero creo que aquí es clave, es clave lo de la, visi, la visibilización. ¿no? El, eh, desde que vi el cartel que puso la, con, con, todo el, con los eventos de la semana que hay aquí en la biblioteca, eh, de hecho lo comenté con, con una compañera, en, en la fotografía del evento, de esta, de esta conferencia, aparece solamente la bandera de Israel. Entonces, desde ese momento, desde ahí empieza la cuestión de visibilización. O sea, hay una de las partes, o hay muchas partes, que en el conflicto, eh, en, en, la, en la realidad de Israel-Palestina están están fuera de foco. Y, y, en, y, en, y en esta charla que nos ha regalado el día de hoy, eh, hablar de State, de Estado, me parece que sigue nublando, aunque entiendo que hay que, el tono del Estado de las cosas es diferente al del Estado con E mayúscula. Eh, una de las propuestas que, sean, que están por ahí en algunos de estos grupos marginales que, que buscan coexistencia como forma de vida. Está el, el término de homeland, de reconocer los derechos de ambos grupos, si todavía podemos dividirlos en israelíes y palestinos, los derechos a la tierra. Aunque sean dos estados, aunque sí existe una simetría brutal en el conflicto, aunque hay una ocupación que se profundiza, eh, uno de los caminos sería reconocer los derechos sobre la tierra. Y, y quizá uno de los problemas eh, eh, sería también este, el de olvidar, de dejar de hablar de naciones, lo que Santa Marina nos comentaba el coloquio anterior, empezar a hablar de ciudadanos. Si un problema existe es que no hay ciudadanos palestinos. Hay ciudadanos árabes israelíes o palestinos israelíes que ven en otro tipo de condiciones dentro de lo que se conoce como el Estado de Israel, en las tierras previas a la ocupación del 67. Y este asunto del existential risk, el riesgo existencial. Sí, hay, un, hay una manipulación por parte de, sobre todo este último gobierno en Israel, de que todo es existencialmente riesgoso para Israel, incluso esa estampilla del artista palestino de Yared. Pero también es cierto que el Estado de Israel se funda a partir de un riesgo existencial de un pueblo, que es el pueblo judío. O sea, aquí hay una confusión en los términos de entre sionista y judío, israelí, que no son lo mismo, pero al final de cuentas resultan ser parte de una historia. Y si hay un riesgo, o sea, vamos, si, si hay un abuso en, la, en, el, en, el, en el uso de la memoria por parte del, del gobierno, de los gobiernos de Israel, estoy totalmente de acuerdo con eso. Ahí. Pero también es cierto que, eh, que, que, que entender al Sabra y entender al judío israelí es también entender de dónde viene esta necesidad de un Estado judío. Hay esos matices que también hay que visibilizar, me parece. Eh, así como hay colonos extremistas, radicales, fundamentalistas, a los que hay que hacerle frente, que, que están rompiendo el concepto de ciudadanía dentro de, del Estado, de ese discurso que rompe el, el discurso del ciudadano israelí, que, tam, que hoy, ven, hoy, hoy se ve a las ONGs de izquierda, 
eh, como traidores por cuestionar la política de ocupación. ¿Qué pasa cuando hay que hacerle frente también a pensamientos como el de Hamas, que también hablan de la destrucción del Estado de Israel, la destrucción de los judíos como parte de ese mal? O, el, o lo mismo que se menciona, ISIS, ¿no? este ejército, el Estado Islámico, que habla de erradicar este mal, que aparentemente son los judíos. Entonces, resumo en, en, esta, en, en mi intención de visibilizar, eh, eh, retomando estas palabras. Uno, eh, ¿cómo distinguir entre sionista israelí y judío? Cuando tenemos esta idea del riesgo existencial que está ahí, en, en, el, en el etos judío-israelí. ¿Y, ¿Y cómo hacer frente en, este, en, en esta propuesta del Estado binacional a pensamientos como el de Hamas y de los yihadistas? Oh. Well, you've asked the kind of fundamental question. Uh, I'll just focus on the last thing you said about, you know, what about ISIS? Uh, what about Hezbollah? What about Hamas? What about Iran? Uh, Israel continually feels itself to be encircled by uh, enemies. Um, but that encirclement would feel, I think, quite different if they could find a way to establish uh, a secular constitutional state uh, in which all of the peoples uh, inside their own borders, uh, which to this day are still uh, not settled, uh, indeterminate. Uh, and uh, it would be, that part would be extremely simple if everyone had the same civil rights within a secular state. We, one problem is, of course, in Zionism, the equivocation between uh, being Jewish as a cultural identity and being Jewish uh, as somebody who is an observant uh, Jew in one of the, the many ways you can do that. Uh, unfortunately, as part of the history of Israel, uh, an ultra-Orthodox uh, system was implanted. It's very deeply uh, linked with the judicial system, controlling marriage controlling rights to property, uh, the, the, your whole status. So uh, until Israel fixes that, I think they're going to feel uh, the existential threat is everywhere. It's all around them in these radical groups uh, who I, you know, you're absolutely right. Many of them call for the destruction of Israel. A little more subtle thing that they say is what the, the Palestinians continually balk at, and that is um, the recognition of Israel as a Jewish state, because that's exactly the, the tipping point, the threshold between the possibility uh, of a secular state in which, uh, as we say in the American Constitution, all men and women are created equal, have equal rights uh, to the pursuit of happiness, etc. But You can't say that and uh, out of the same mouth that says we are a Jewish state. Uh, and it becomes even more emphatic if that Jewish state is religiously defined, culturally defined as an ethnic entity. It's like saying, uh, a lot of people say the United States is a Christian country. Big debate over that. Thomas Jefferson was an atheist. He thought it was ridiculous to talk about uh, the United States as being a Christian nation. Uh, the United States still hasn't completely come to terms with that, which is why Donald Trump can lecture uh, riot, riotous crowds cheering wildly when he uh, portrays Islam as an existential threat to the U.S. Uh, and inflates things like ISIS, which uh, ISIS is now being treated as if it were uh, a military threat to the U.S. It's nothing of the kind. It's not an existential threat to us. 
And the terrorists, Al-Qaeda, was not an existential threat. It was a terrorist organization uh, capable of striking in suburbs, uh, the, capable of striking the World Trade Center, of doing great damage, but it could never dream of invading and occupying the United States. But that blurring you talk about has, I think, occurred at the level of uh, a reactionary rhetoric against what are seen as these world historical threats. It's as if the war on terror has taken over from the Cold War, when you could plausibly say that the US and the Soviet Union were arrayed against each other, armed to the teeth with nuclear missiles. Uh, and in 1963, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a feeling that, <clears throat> yes, this could be an existential threat when Kennedy and Khrushchev faced off. Uh, there could have been a nuclear exchange at that moment. And uh, we saw what a real existential threat looks like to nuclear superpowers arrayed against one another. The only difference I see between ISIS and Al Qaeda is that ISIS decided to call itself a state and to occupy territory, uh, to take over uh, the Sunni heartland in Iraq and, and in Syria uh, against the Shiite regimes in uh, Baghdad and uh, in Damascus. So they are a threat there to the existence of those Shiite regimes because of occupying territory, taking cities uh, uh, and subjecting them to brutal occupations. But all of that strikes me as, uh, and I basically follow Obama's wise restraint in this, to inflate this into an existential threat to the US and think that we should now set things right by invading and occupying Syria or Iraq, which many Republican politicians would like to do. Uh, Donald Trump, aided by somebody like John McCain, uh, argues this seriously. You know, we have to get tough. We have to start taking these people seriously. They constantly make comparisons to Nazi Germany. Every time Obama says anything conciliatory, for instance, we had, what, 10 U.S. sailors who were uh, captured the other day in the uh, Persian Gulf by the Iranians. They released them in less than 24 hours. Why? Because we can actually talk to the Iranians now. We can have a conversation, a dialogue. Uh, and the Iranians, the Iranians don't want a nuclear war. Uh, and they themselves are divided. What, what I th think has uh, become the existential threat to the world is the inflation of that language of existential threat, that everyone wants to gain power by saying, I will deal with the threat, and I will deal with it in the most emphatic, direct way. That's by the use of force. Military force is the answer. It's always the answer of the fascist tendencies in any country. Uh, and it, it's a powerful force in my own country, and uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, very powerful inside Israel. Uh, because it makes you feel like that's the only alternative. Can't really talk to those people. So that's a kind of, a, I don't think I've addressed everything you had to say, but uh, I hope that gets at at least part of it. Había dos entonces ahí. Ah, no. Adelante. No, no es una confusión. Eh, thank you, Tom, for this fascinating lecture. Eh, of course, you are talking about a very concrete situation, but sometimes your view makes that that uh, all you are talking about is like a metaphor or like a allegory of a control, resistance, the role of art. And for moments, 
I was thinking that uh, maybe we all are like a occupied territory. No? Thank you for that. I have three very small questions. The first is that uh, in this kind of situations, normally the sense of identity is uh, radicalized. And uh, I, I haven't seen that in your in this art. So my question is, if these artists have gone beyond this, uh, uh, beyond that uh, strong sense of identity, cultural or ethnic identity. That's the first question. The second one is, uh, if you would if you would go to say that throwing stones to the military is an act of art, like an action, action of art, and why? And the third question is that this, uh, all this irony, humor, and the, the, the tournament, the, the tournament, this, this word, French word uh, that used the situationist, uh, makes me think that this kind of art is in the tradition of situationism. situationism. And if, if there is a real uh, link of these works to situationism, if they refer to, no? that's all, thank you. I, I'm not sure I really understood the question about fragmentation. Were you su suggesting that th th these artists don't deal with the condition of fragmentation? Uh, if, sorry, fragmentation. No, no the, the, the question is uh, that uh, the first, que first question is th these artists are not uh, working in the sense of cultural identity. Identity. No? For example, like. And, and, uh, that, 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 because normally in this kind of occupied territories, resistance is the like a strengthened identity, no? Yeah, I, I, my own, this is just my uh, opinion, having looked at a lot of art in both uh, Israeli artists, Palestinian artists, is that the affirmation of identity is, is relatively rare, that it's um, not something that is foremost in the minds of especially the good artists. I mean, like any place, uh, there's plenty of what you might call traditional art, ethnographic arts and crafts, where uh, the artists are simply doing the things that the, their teachers did. Uh, they're repeating, so they're, you know, Palestinian folk arts, uh, especially fabrics, uh, clothes, uh, all kinds of designs, pottery, and so forth. Um, and it's, I mean, it's mainly tourist, uh, for tourist consumption. Um, perfectly nice. Uh, I have a, a, a little Palestinian tapestry hanging in uh, the hallway in my house. I, I like it a lot, but I wouldn't put it in the same category with uh, what I'm looking for, which is an art of resistance, uh, an art of critique, uh, an art that looks at the world, tries to make sense of it, and also tries to imagine alternatives. So the, uh, this painting by Asim Abu Chakra, to me, epitomizes um, a kind of subtle and almost sly insinuation of the very fragmentation that constitutes identity in, uh, inside Israel, for a Palestinian painter, incredibly talented, uh, a kind of he was seen as the Jackson Pollock of uh, of his moment because he could also make abstractions that were absolutely luscious and gorgeous. It's a rare talent to be able to handle oil paint this way. So he could have just made abstractions, uh, but he included this iconography of the Sabra as uh, it was a subtle compliment to and a kind of deconstruction of the whole issue. Uh, of identity at the same time. And so in, in a way, what I've been looking for is the, the, the art that I find uh, works across borders of identity. 
that looks for hybrid formations, uh, that examines the actual fractured state uh, not only of the, the state as a condition of a social condition, but also of individual selves. Uh, it, it, here is uh, the, the ambassador to the United Nations from Israel, one of the most famous patriarchs of the first generation, the great generation of Israeli founders, holding like a, a, a child his sabra plant in the pot. And he himself is a transplanted Sabra, born in South Africa. Uh, so that, that kind of art, uh, to me, is what's really interesting. Here's another one uh, while we're on this. I didn't get to Larry Abramson's very abstract canvas. It's called uh, Eliakim Chalakim, and it's uh, a painting that combines uh, painterly abstraction with uh, a kind of de Kooning interlace in the upper area. Uh, uh, he's invoking the figure with, with the raised arms of the prophet approaching the Holy Land. Uh, Eliakim Chalakim is a, uh, a kind of uh, uh, the name of the prophet who will deliver us from the wilderness. He's also put a crescent hanging from the black abstract breastplate. It's the crescent of the scimitar uh, of the Saracen, uh, the, the Muslim warrior. So you can read it as a kind of figure with a, his dagger in his belt and his abstract bre breastplate. But it's all based on an improvised salvage operation of different elements, European modernism, uh, abstract expressionism, uh, traditional uh, Arab iconography, and uh, the title of it, uh, El Yakim Kalakim, is a popular phrase of assembling a human figure out of fragments. Here, here is the original. It's the cabbage patch kit, uh, the, the garbage pail kit, uh, the human figure uh, assembled out of spare parts. Uh, what Larry did was to uh, assemble that into a kind of sublime abstraction. So th this is the kind of art I find uh, most wonderful and uh, in, the, in its visionary and critical capacity to think beyond, I am an Israeli and I know what that means, or I am a Palestinian and that's all I am. Uh, these notions that we know who we are, I mean, I don't know who the hell I am. I'm an American cowboy from Nevada with Irish ancestors and a, a German grandmother. Uh, so, what is my identity? In, if, I'm, if my back is against the wall, I have to show my passport, I'm an American. Uh, but th that is not a sufficient label. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you a very tough question. Um, I've been thinking about many, many things as I as I listen to you. Um, I have in the background of my mind the question about your particular way of thinking about the uh, boycott and divestment movement and your own position in it. You spoke a little bit about it. Um, I am also thinking about um, the impression I have that one of the things that makes that um, permanent state of war much more terrible is that there is a kind of generalized symbolic erosion. So just as things are invisibilized in Israeli society in the way that you describe, um, I think similar things happen in many different ways amongst the Palestinians and amongst the peoples of the countries close and far. It happens in television. So in other words, I'm, I have the sense of a real need for the affirmation of, of symbolic circulation, which in my personal case um, makes me wonder whether uh, 
BDS make sense in terms of promoting that symbolic circulation. We, um, I mean, they're, they're, I'm, I'm taking the opportunity to intervene because there's all sorts of curatorial considerations at play in, in your intervention in relation to this colloquium, its, its themes and also um, the way the conference is going to end. And I think it's interesting to simply make, make this explicit. Now, my question is probably a double one and, and it's, it's, it's complex, uh, but you're pretty used to dealing with complex stuff, right? Especially from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say it in two different ways. The first and more, more explicit one, um, no, I think I'll do it the other way around. Suppose you met an Israeli free jazz musician. Um, in terms of all of this discussion, and BDS, does the logic of him being Israeli have the upper hand over his being a free jazz musician? Or might free jazz somehow in its logic have greater strength than any identitarian um, implications of his being Israeli might have? In other words, um, and this is a question that I'm very happy to be able to ask you on the basis of your massive um, trajectory and work. And this is perhaps the central question of this conference that we're so happy to share with you and with Janice and with all the other friends and, and guests and people here. Let us suppose we can assume that the logic of improvisation can be understood as the logic of art as a whole. Do you think improvisation and art, symbolic free creation, in other words, in logical terms, has greater power than the logic the logics of identity, of closure, of violence, of atrocity? Or are we barking up the wrong tree and in the end, the, the logic of atrocity, violence, closure, and identity, however we may not like it, in fact, ends up winning the game? Well, that's about as difficult a question as I think you could imagine, Benjamin. Thank you. Um, let me answer it in relation to BDS and the boycott, because I think it's, uh, it's a way of concretizing this question of uh, whether improvisation has any chance uh, against the power of violence, of identity, and so forth. I mean, in, insofar as that's a question of uh, uh, prediction, you know, will it prevail? Nobody knows. Uh, I, I can't predict. Uh, but I think uh, our job as scholars, uh, as artists, is to pretend that it is the case, that we will prevail, uh, and that we will not settle for uh, being locked into the positions we're in by our identities, uh, by the states that wage war in our names. That's why I very much supported uh, an organization during the Bush administration called Not In Our Name, uh, where we said, what is being done in the invasion of Iraq is not being done in my name. Don't, don't try to sit, lay this at my door. I refuse it. I reject it. Um, so part of that is making visible 
what the violence is. Uh, I think it's a task of art to make things visible, also to make them audible, um, to, to make the dark side of identity visible, uh, to show how it prevents uh, understanding of oneself, much less the understanding of someone else, that it reduces your sense of self. Uh, this was what I think is, is the real horror. Uh, you know, when I show that little clip of the Israeli soldier talking about the Palestinians as animals and Ramallah as a zoo, you know, a lot of my sympathies are with that young soldier because what I see there is a perfectly nice young man who a few years earlier would not uh, talk about the people that, uh, that live down the road from him that way. He's been taught that way by a state that, and, and in a way he's improvising in that moment. He's saying what the state will not say out loud. So the filmmaker deserves a lot of credit for capturing that moment. And this young man in his way is just being honest. Remember he says, I don't care if they show this film to the general staff, you see, because he knows. Of course, that's the way they view it and that's what they are turning us into is zookeepers. Uh, but when you're a zookeeper for human beings, you know your own moral, your own soul is being corrupted by that. So it, with the boycott movement, I mean, I've had to struggle with it myself because it is a way, uh, boycotts are one of the first instruments that the weak use to try to fight back against the powerful. Uh, we simply will not uh, collaborate with you. But a BDS following, of course, the, uh, the boycott of South Africa, uh, the boycott of, a, of a, the apartheid state of South Africa, it's very much modeled on that, uh, has recognized that belonging to the boycott movement does not answer all your questions for you. For instance, one part of the boycott movement, the one led by Omar Barghouti, in the West Bank says the West East Divan must be boycotted because it's normalizing, you know, it's pretending, trying to use art to pretend that we can just get along. We can, and it's a terrible thing because after all, Edward Said was regarded by many, many as the great prophet of the Palestinian movement. But Edward, and he's my, my moral model here, was always saying things like, you know why I want there to be a Palestinian state? Uh, so that I can take up my proper role and attack it. He, he also, he had a sense that the, the, the end goal was not to be confused with the means. The boycott is a means. It's a means to speak to tr truth to power. It's a means to say, uh, we will not cooperate. But at the level of individuals, at the level of ethical relations, uh, I think the boycott explicitly says we do not boycott individuals. Israeli academics, artists uh, are free to come to the U.S. We do not uh, treat them as the enemy. Uh, but we do treat the institutions, the things that benefit from the state power that are uh, directly involved in it. Now, I know that immediately all of the deconstructionists out there are going to say, well, individuals and institutions, how do you differentiate them? And that's, of course, the moral struggle and the political struggle that's involved in, uh, in committing to this movement. I disagree with Barghouti. I think it's a huge mistake for the boycott movement to disrespect Edward Said's legacy. On the other hand, I understand his arguments so we are in solidarity for 99% of the boycott. I have this one reservation. It doesn't mean I leave the movement, uh, but it does. There is no attachment or movement or label that you can hang on to that makes you risk-free, that puts you in a state beyond conflict uh, internally or uh, with your comrades. So. I, th I think we have to trust uh, the, the, our better angels in this. 
so I want to reject it. any inclination of pessimism. I know you're just you're you're mimicking that. I know you believe just as much as I do that uh, uh, there is no answer to your question. Can we conquer power, identity, violence with art? Of course, I mean I want to say no, and then we'll go have a few drinks and we'll say yes. Um, first, I want to thank you for a truly moving presentation. I, uh, it was um, an eye-opener and a heart-opener for me. But I'm, I'm going to say something, maybe I'm going to take the risk of maybe sounding a, a little foolish. But I, uh, I think you stopped just a step short. And uh, the border at which you stopped, I think, was the realistic, the real. I think terrorists are, no doubt, great, improvisa uh, great at improvisation. And that's why I think we have to move beyond. We have to take one step further. What I mean is neither a one state or a two state solutions are real solutions given the state of things. Uh, I think we have to use a different set of tools for imagination if we are really going to be rock and rolled. Art in that way is profoundly powerful. And uh, that, that, that's where I think the, the real is a border where we cannot stop because it is realistic to say that art has, has not the power, the political power or the, or the, yeah, the power to transform such a situation. But I, I believe that artists should not conform to political discourse because artists should not conform to reality. So do you have a question? You've told me what you believe. Yeah, no, I don't have a question. I just wanted to, to say that, to thank you and to, yeah. to, to say yeah. that. I mean, uh, uh, one part of what you said I'm very sympathetic to. Uh, I think um, the, the art of propaganda, uh, of art which simply serves a political message is of dubious interest. Um, I mean, as art, it can often be effective for changing minds. For instance, um, in another uh, role, I, I've written about the Occupy movement in the United States and uh, also the way Occupy became a kind of international uh, movement that linked the Arab Spring to, to the Occupy movement in the United States and across Europe as well. Uh, th uh, there was a lot of what you might call propaganda art, poster art uh, involved in that, direct, very directly political art. And I think, you know, uh, much of it was clever, uh, beautiful, well done, but the massive, overwhelming work of art that Occupy produced was it's simply the fact of the performance of occupation of a million people occupying Tahrir Square, of 10,000 people occupying Zuccotti Park in New York, of uh, 10,000 people in Grant Park in Chicago. Uh, those performances were not just political gatherings, they were also what the situation is called detour months of a whole discourse uh, about where the public is located, who the people are, what a mass gathering is for. And the reason that Occupy became, I think, such a global uh, rhetoric and a discourse was because it transformed the meaning of that very word. What does it mean to occupy? Well, most of our language of Occupy has been about uh, the state, about military occupation. Uh, and my central subject today has been about an occupation in which uh, roughly half of a population is occupied, subjugated uh, to continuous acts of uh, structural violence and real violence on a daily basis. Uh, 
but during the Occupy movement, um, Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv was suddenly occupied by a tent city that included uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, conservative and reformed Jews, Palestinians, Bedouins, uh, unhappy with the, the Israeli state. Uh, not only its foreign policy, not only its domestic policy of occupation, but also uh, its, its economic policy, which uh, it, uh, yesterday we heard a lot about oligarchy. One thing that unites the U.S. and Israel very closely is uh, that they're both ruled by tiny oligarchies of extraordinarily rich people who own most of the resources of the country. So I wrote an essay called The Arts of Occupation, which was the posters, some of them were great, some of them were mediocre. I wouldn't generalize to say, well, all poster art, propaganda art is just debased. Uh, it varies. You need to look at it and, uh, and make a judgment. But Occupy itself as a, as a, a performance, a massive global performance of populations asserting themselves, saying, we are here, we want to be visible. Uh, we will not be taken for granted. In some cases, in most cases, it failed. Uh, in the U.S., it was suppressed by violence. In Egypt, it was suppressed by very, very, much worse violence. In Syria, you know, it was uh, basically a genocide against the Syrian state's own people. Uh, millions of people. Uh, but that doesn't discredit the, the gesture, and it doesn't erase it from memory. So one of our tasks as scholars is to remember that, uh, to understand why it happened, what it did, what it failed to do, uh, and, and to continue. That's what being an artist or a scholar is, in my view. Uh, Maybe it's as simple as saying, you know, something incredibly naive and stupid as, you know, we must not allow ourselves to become cynical, uh, to become discouraged. Uh, we mustn't give up and say, uh, okay, we've made a calculated estimation. But the state is just too powerful. The oligarchy, they own, have all the money, they have all the, the land. Uh, e very easy to say that. Let's just go back, till our gardens, be private people. Uh, we have nothing to do with politics. Let's do our art. But then some artists, and the ones that I love and admire, like Larry Abramson, uh, like Asim Abu Chakra, they find a way, uh, even with very abstract and indirect means, to say something else, uh, to continue a struggle, which I think is what really makes us human. Okay, I think we can come to close with those words. Tenemos que terminar y creo que es un buen punto para hacerlo. Les pido un fuerte aplauso para Tom. Bueno, tantas gracias a cada uno. Reanudamos entonces a las cuatro y media.